Welcome to Cheese in Depth. Today, we're talking with Brian Fiscalini from Fiscalini Cheese. It's always been a pleasure working with Brian, one of my first uh, times at a creamery and a farm uh, was with the Fiscalinis. It was very generous of them. They, they spent a lot of time, an entire day, uh, walking me through the entire process. And I'll, I'll never really forget that. It was such a great experience. And uh, I'm looking forward to being able to talk with uh, Brian a little bit more and kind of catch up on things that are going on. So uh, I'm going to uh, turn it over to Brian. And uh, so uh, please welcome uh, Brian Fiscalini. Hi, Brian. Hi, Michael. It's great to be able to connect with you right now in these uncertain times. Um, I always enjoy being in person with you and educating people about cheese and sharing our passion that both of us have for artisan cheeses and um, looking forward to talking with you today. Me too. So tell us a, a little bit of history on the farm. Sure, absolutely. My great-grandfather immigrated to the United States from Switzerland back in the late 1800s. And he began dairy farming here in Modesto, California, where we still dairy farm today, uh, in, the, in 1914. So we've been around for over 100 years. And then in the year 2000, we decided to get into the cheese making business. And my father, John, was very passionate to create a product that was branded with our family's name so that when he was in the grocery store, he could tell his three children where exactly the milk from our cows ended up on the shelf. So it was kind of a unique story as to why he got into the cheese making business, uh, but that's what we're doing today. And we also, in the year 2009, got into a new technology to convert methane gas into electricity. So we capture the waste from our cows that we have here on our farm. Uh, we convert that waste into electricity that helps us offset our carbon footprint. And then we also sell electricity to our utility that powers about 300 homes in our local community. That's cool. So you uh, sent me a video. Would you like to uh, want me to present that? Yeah, it's a nice video that was done a uh, little over a year ago on our family and it really highlights you know everything that we do from how we take care of our cows to the methodical and traditional cheese making practices that we do and then it also speaks to our digester project that i just spoke about My dad was very excited to put his name on our cheese because when you walk into the grocery store and you see milk, it's just in a gallon and you don't know what farm it came from, you don't know where it was produced, you don't know the history behind the people who made it. And with our cheese, we were able to tell a story, put our name on a product and be proud of the name Fiscalini. If he was going to make cheese, he wanted to make the world's best cheese. So my great-grandfather started this business back in 1914 with 12 Holstein cows, so a very small dairy farm. You know, it was about the basics, just taking care of the cows and, and creating a really good product. It is a, an art. It's a special technique that not everyone is able to do well. I do consider myself an artist. It takes a, a lot of time and energy and a lot of hands-on approach to create something with your hands to create a, a premium cheese. Everyone here works very hard. Their job's labor intensive. They're leaning into the vat, working with their hands. It's, it's hard work. So I think the fact that we are a farmstead operation, which means that the cows are here, the milk's produced here, and the cheese is made here, makes us extremely unique. We get to see this process literally from day one. And day one for us is the day that calf is born. As a veterinarian, I can personally speak that the health and care of these animals is second to none. You can't make a good quality cheese without the finest quality milk. Soy lechero y me encanta ver cada día las becerritas nuevas. 
me encanta trabajar en las vacas porque siempre, toda mi vida, hemos tenido vacas. Our team that makes this cheese is super passionate about it, and that's gonna come through in every bite. Beyond our dairy barns and our cheese plant, we farm 460 acres that helps us control the quality of the feed for the cows that produce the high quality milk that makes our cheese. Our methane digester powers our dairy farm, our cheese plant, and 300 homes in our local community. I mean, my great-grandfather and grandfather were making sure that they took care of the land so that they could pass it to the next generation. To know that this is here for our children means the world to us, and we're truly blessed to have something like this to pass on with a great family name. When people all over the world are trying and tasting our products, they're gonna know that it was made on a small farm in Modesto, California, that produces renewable energy, takes care of their cows, and does things the Fiscalini way. We are family. We are farmstead. We are Fiscalini cheese. Very impressive, thank you. Yeah, thanks for sharing that, Michael. You're welcome. So tell us a little bit about, uh, you know, the, the breed of cattle that, because I know you started with Holstein, but you moved on from that. Yeah, in the video it mentioned that my great grandfather started with 12 Holstein cows. And we have milked Holstein cows up until we started making cheese. Um, we still do today, but we've added the Jersey breed as well as Brown Swiss to help increase the butter fat and protein content uh, that really helps our cheese take on the great flavors that, that we have today. You know, uh, when, when deciding to make the different styles of cheese, I, and didn't uh, the breed of animal also kind of influence uh, the direction? Do you use the same milk for every single cheese? So we do use milk from the same group of animals for every cheese that we make. So we do have one group of cows that has uh, our younger Holstein cows, as well as the Jerseys and the Brown Swiss. And we feed them a special diet that is really tailored toward a higher butter fat milk, uh, really good protein so that we get the cheese yield that we're looking for. And it just has all the characteristics that we're looking for to make excellent award-winning cheeses. You know, we talk about the quality of the milk and how important that is. And uh, a lot of people don't realize that, you know, it's very difficult to be able to get the quality up to standards and, and maintain a healthy herd of animals. And that um, indicator would be semantic cell count. Tell us a little bit about that and the kind of controls and the quality you have there. Yeah, so, you know, in, in normal terms, somatic cell count is the white blood cell count that is present in the milk. And what it is, is it's an indicator of how clean your facility is, how healthy your cows are, and that all your sanitation processes are working well for you. If you talk to any cheesemaker out there, they will tell you that they know before the laboratory does if you've got an issue with your milk. So we make cheese five days a week and the quality of the milk varies slightly from day to day, but it does vary enough that our cheesemakers know right away if the butter fat has changed, the somatic cell count has gone up. Um, that's, the, that's the really unique and, and awesome part about making cheese the way that we do, is we don't standardize the milk. So however it comes out of the cow is how it goes into our cheese vats. 
And every day is a challenge. You learn something new every day about quality of the milk, how quickly or slowly your starter cultures are working. Um, so when our cheesemakers come to work, it's not like they can expect to push a button and a process is going to take exactly 20 minutes. It could take 20 minutes today and it could take 25 tomorrow and then 15 minutes the next day. So we really have to be on top of our game, uh, managing the cheese making process from start to finish. You're also challenged by seasonality. Uh, tell us a little bit about how uh, seasonality plays a part on yours. Yeah, so here we are the uh, the final days of May, and we just got hit with a unique heat wave. Uh, it's 104 degrees today, and it's supposed to be 107 degrees tomorrow. So uh, we have very hot, dry summers. Um, and then we have, you know, winters where we will get rain. Uh, the humidity level definitely goes up. So we're trying to manage not only the environmental differences uh, from heat to cold to, to dry months to wet months, but we're also managing the seasonality of the diets that the cows eat based on what ingredients are available throughout the year. So it really is an art. Um, it can be very frustrating some days and it can also be very rewarding on other days to know that we try to do our best to balance the diet that the cows eat, to take care of them the same way every day so that we can have a very high quality milk that is the base ingredient for all of our cheeses. You know, when uh, you started making cheese uh, that really came from scratch. So you did a lot of the designing and building also of some of the uh, support, uh, the aging rooms and some of the ways of being able to handle turning and handling cheese. Tell us about that. Yeah, so my father has always had a really good mind for building things. To this day, he still uh, works in his wood shop uh, most of the day. He really enjoys tinkering and building things. And our cheesemakers uh, in the early days, they had come to us and they said, hey, we have these 60 pound wheels of banded wrap cheddar that need to be flipped every day for the first 60 days. So they, they came to my father and I can remember them asking him, do you think that you could design something that would help us turn the cheese so that we don't have to pick these up every day and flip them over by hand. Um, our, our turning room right now holds 480 wheels of cheese. That'll take about all day if that's all you're gonna do. So what my father created was a design for what we now call our turning rack. And in high school, I was taking an ag mechanics class through the FFA program. So I was learning how to weld and my father handled the woodworking, I handled the welding, and we were able to successfully build a set of turning racks so that our employees now can turn 480 wheels of cheese that weigh 60 to 65 pounds a piece in less than an hour. So it's really helped uh, our employee morale, you know, obviously it, it's helping that backbreaking work uh, be done much easier so that they can focus on cheese making more than flipping wheels. So when you were uh, uh, deciding to make cheeses and you were starting to go through that process, what are some of the things that you were considering when, uh, you know, making the different styles of cheese? So I was very young when we started making cheese. So it, it was not my decision as to which cheeses we were gonna make. My father really wanted to make sure that we 
maintain some of our family tradition. And being that our family came to the United States from Switzerland, he always wanted to make an Alpine style cheese. Uh, that wasn't the first cheese that we made. We actually believed that we were making a Fontina and our first cheesemaker, Tom and myself, were attempting to follow a Fontina recipe that we found from, I think it was one of the universities in our area that sent us a Fontina recipe. So we did our best to make Fontina with 40 pound cheddar blocks um, without the right cultures. And uh, we, we butchered the recipe a little bit. And uh, that Fontina that we thought we were making is now today our San Joaquin Gold, which we, you know, inside the company, we joke that that's our gold medal mistake. Um, then you fast forward about a year and our, our first experienced cheesemaker, Mariano Gonzalez, came to us from Vermont and he had experience making cloth bound cheddars. So we began to make that as my father and I were not master experienced cheesemakers. We relied heavily on the expertise of Mariano to help us develop the cheese that is now called bandage wrap cheddar. And he and my father also took a trip to Switzerland. They left me at home because I think someone had to take care of the cows. But um, they they researched the Ticino Valley in Switzerland, where our family, you know, originated from. And they came up with a recipe by talking to some of the local people there and visiting some cheesemakers. We came up with the recipe for what now is our Leonza, our Alpine style Swiss cheese named after the town in Switzerland uh, where some of our family still lives. Being ecologically concerned or, uh, you know, driven that way, you started creating uh, the biodigester or putting that together and being able to do that. But as I understand it, it wasn't uh, uh, a simple process of just getting those two together. Tell us about that journey. Yeah, journey is a nice word. Um, we, we might use a different word if we were to go back and, and relive every moment that has been our renewable energy project over the last 10 years. You know, it was really challenging in the beginning. My father was extremely committed to making this project work. We invested a lot of time, um, a lot of effort, and it really, it evolved into the first project in the state of California, like its type, and therefore, you know, there were new regulations that were put on our project because some of the agencies weren't sure exactly how to regulate this brand new project. So we had to, re, uh, we had to meet very strict guidelines when it came to air quality and water quality we've been able to meet and exceed those requirements and we've really become the poster child for future dairy digester projects. Um, it has not been easy along the way. There were times where you know my father was ready to abandon the project. He stayed committed to it and you know there's a, there's a lot to be said for his level of commitment and all that he's been through. I, I think it may have led him into early retirement uh, because that project, I mean, it took a toll on him. He, he really, he was trying to do the right thing. Um, you know, and the, reg, the regulators weren't necessarily doing anything wrong, but um, it was very challenging for us to come up to speed. And then there were regulations that changed along the way. So uh, the project cost our, you know, cost our business three times more than what we budgeted and anticipated for. So we have, we've learned a lot along the way. I, I don't want to say that we're, we're digester experts by any means, 
but we've learned and we've forgot more about digesters, I think, than we ever anticipated doing or knowing. So it's been an interesting ride. I can thankfully say that the project is, is successful. It's running well today. And it's opened the door for, um, for new projects associated with it that we're still working on this day. I wanted uh, just uh, to let everybody know that it was, it was a very difficult but rewarding now because, you know, you are the poster child for being able to do this. A lot of other uh, farms and cheesemakers have followed suit by watching all the things that you don't want to have happen. <laughs> so, all right. So let's talk a little bit about the creamery and uh, some of the things that you do. What's a typical day? Uh, how many, uh, you know, uh, different cheeses do you make? Do you have a set schedule? You know, tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, I, I mentioned earlier that one of the really unique parts about our creamery and how we make cheese is that there is no one day that is the same as another. So the quality of the milk, the cultures, the ambient temperature outside, all of these things play a role in our day-to-day -day cheese making. So we make cheese five days a week. We do not have a set schedule as to which cheeses we're going to make. Uh, we, it's pretty simple how we do it. I'd, I'd like to pretend that maybe it's more complex than it is, but it really depends on the capacity of our aging rooms as well as how our sales are going. So if a particular cheese is moving very well, uh, you know, we'll, we'll increase the production and the inventory of that cheese and vice versa. So it's a challenge to manage fixed aging rooms. We don't have hundreds of thousands of square feet of cold storage that we can just stockpile. We're managing the, the rooms that we have and we're trying to expand them as we can. But we make about 12 different cheeses right now. Um, of those, three are raw milk cheeses. The other cheeses are pasteurized milk. Uh, the raw milk cheeses are the ones that we'll be trying today. That means that they must be aged for a minimum of 60 days, which in our case, the youngest of those cheeses is six months old. So the range goes from six to 14 months. And in some cases, the cheese will age slightly longer than that, but the goal is that our sales team is uh, aligned with what cheeses we have in inventory, and that's what we try to push at any given moment. I was uh, busy behind the scenes getting myself a beer. Uh, you know, so, you know I, I thought that it would be appropriate for a pairing. You know, one of the things that, uh, of pairings that I really enjoy with cheddars and the style of cheeses that we're going to have, our IPAs and uh, I'm, I decided to pick a, a straight line from uh, the family owned Sierra Nevadas and thought that that would be fairly appropriate for today, uh, two family owned companies and being able to pair that up. Plus, uh, I just uh, love how IPAs, India Pale Ales work with these. So I was getting a little ahead of you there and, uh, <clears throat> but, so anything else you want to tell us about uh, the farm before we get into some tasting? Every time I get an opportunity to share our story with new people, um, they really enjoy learning about the cows and, you know, what we do that may be a little different than your average dairy farm. And if you come out to our dairy and you see our cows, one of the first questions that people ask me is, what's on the back leg of your cow? And every one of our lactating cows has a pedometer uh, that's also an identification system. So that when our cows come into our milking barn, that animal is identified as well as the number of steps that the cow takes 
are tracked every day so that we can manage a 1,500 cow dairy farm on an individual cow basis. And as you can imagine, dairy farm technology today has evolved incredibly from where it was when my grandfather or my great grandfather were dairy farming. So we have a technology and a software program that we can look up our cows from our phones or from tablets um, or from the computer in our office. And we can see how the cows are performing. And most importantly, we can pinpoint the animals that may need special attention. Uh, and that's really impactful for our business because we really pride ourselves on the longevity and the milk production and the quality of the milk, the genetics, um, all of the things that our family has worked very, very hard to accomplish over our, you know, 106 year history. So I really like to share the story of how we manage our animals and how we care for them and how important the health of our, of our animals and of course our employees that help us take care of those animals. So uh, I just like to let people know that, but now we can, we can get into tasting some cheese. Uh, what do you want to start with today? So I've got some of the cheeses here next to me as well as they're, they're next to you, Michael. Um, I'll go ahead and I'll start with our, our bandage wrap cheddar. So, that is the cheese that has a, a black label on it. Um, it's made in a 60 to 65 pound wheel. It has a very sharp cheddar flavor. It's also got a crunchy texture that comes throughout the aging process. So it's made with raw milk, like I said. Uh, we only have cows, no, no goats or sheep on our farm. And it's aged for a minimum of 14 months. Uh, when you try this cheese, you'll immediately know that this isn't your grandfather's cheddar, right? This is um, an English style, uh, very sharp cheddar cheese that can be used in so many different applications. Um, and we were blessed and honored to have this cheese win the best farmhouse cheddar at the World Cheese Awards that are held in London every year. And to this day, we are still the only cheese company outside of the United Kingdom uh, to be honored that award. So uh, a tribute to our cheesemakers, um, to the quality of milk that we have, and you know, just that we've been able to consistently make this cheese and have it be our best-selling cheese um, a really great, great story that a, a small farm in Modesto, California was able to successfully win an award that has never left the United Kingdom uh, prior to us winning it for the first time. Well, I have to say that uh, I've been enjoying this cheese for a, a long time. Um, and I also want to thank you for the sheer size of my samples today because uh, you know this will uh, be a nice uh, happy hour today, tomorrow, and probably for the next few weeks because it's a nice chunk of cheese. But you know, um, tell us about the the process of bandage wrapping and why you would do that. Sure. So more people have heard of cloth bound than they may have heard of bandage wrapped, but those are synonymous terms. So what we do is when we prepare our stainless steel hoops that hold about 60 to 65 pounds of our cheddar cheese curd is we insert a cloth or a bandage um, into the hoop so that when we pour the curd into the hoop it is held together with that cheesecloth or bandage. So then when we remove the hoop 
from the curd and the bandage the following day after cheese making, uh, we have a very tight, tightly held cheese with the bandage that's around it. So what we're then able to do is we, we rub the exterior of the cheese and then we put it into our aging rooms so that a rind will naturally be created and protect this huge wheel of cheese throughout the aging process. So we'll make sure that the bacteria that are growing and the rind that is being created on the outside of the cheese is a very thin layer so that you can enjoy a very nice piece of cheese with only having a thin layer of rind on the outside. You know, that kind of, when you, when you think about the aging of this cheese and, uh, you know, it's, it, it, look at that. It's just, it is not a hard, you know, uh, terribly difficult cheese. It, it really is such a beautiful crumbly cheese. So much butter is in this. It's just, just incredible uh, how much sweetness there is along with a little bit of tanginess. But, the tanginess isn't overpowering. It has a nice balance of flavor. Um, with this, because um, of the richness of this, uh, I am uh, pairing this with a, a Volpi and uh, a really nice uh, Genoa uh, little salami. Pairing it with uh, the Torpedo, but this is an extra IPA. I got the uh, IPA pack for uh, for this uh, tasting. So a little uh, sausage uh, salami, and uh, what do you what do you usually pair this up with for yourself? Very similar to what what you've paired with a good a good dry salami. Um, we try to find a beer that has the right amount of acidity but not a beer that, you know, is overpowering so that the acidity in the of the cheese and the acidity of the beer clash. We, we like them to complement each other. And, you know, Michael, you and I over the years have done a lot of beer and cheese pairings. And we find that our, our cheddar cheese isn't impossible to pair uh, with beer but it can be a challenge due to that age and sharpness uh, with a crisp beer. So, you know, you really gotta have fun with it. Uh, you gotta find some good beers. I tend to go with a beer that's gonna be a little bit on the, um, a little bit more on the fruity side so that the acidity and the fruitiness of the beer complement each other rather than a, you know, triple IPA or something like that, but you can tell us how, how your pairing is going over there. Well, I, I was originally going to start off with the uh, pale ale, and, uh, uh, which is one of my favorites for anything that has some tanginess to it. But in reality, uh, the torpedo uh, is actually a little bit better of a, a choice. Uh, it doesn't have, it's not a real hot bomb, and that's one of the things that I have a friend that won't even touch IPAs because, the, because they don't really care about the intensity of the hops. But this is uh, Sierra Nevada, and they have they use the whole cluster hops. They don't use the pellets. So you really get a balance of that. You know, you're not overpowered by the citrus or the pine. It's just a nice, even hoppiness that really works really well with the cheddar. And this bandage wrap also has a little bit of earthiness to it, especially the closer that you get to this rind, the more earthy you really pick that up. And that really plays really well with the two, uh, that you really get that intensity uh, and flavor. And then when you add something like a Genoa salami, it has that really meat to it. So the butter and the fattiness of the salami works really well. And then you have that little bit of tanginess and that's where the beer comes in. And that's to cleanse off all that extra butter and all that fat there 
And it literally lets you be able to enjoy that and then go back and start almost fresh again so your palate doesn't get worn down. And so, uh, you know, you could pretty much go through a, a, a beer and as much as you can possibly stuff into your mouth without feeling uh, overwhelmed. I think that's the challenge, isn't it? It is, it is, because, you know, these are just so uh, magnificent. You know, this was the cheese that I made uh, when I came in uh, to spend the day with you. And one of the problems, I guess, comes with that. And, uh, and this, is, this is probably the moment that I had beyond respect for the ability. I mean, they were there at the farm at four o'clock in the morning, getting the milk, getting everything set and all that. And by the time that we were getting the curds and uh, hooping them, it was uh, probably 2.30, 3 o'clock in the afternoon. So, you know, you almost got, you know, 11, 12 hours uh, into this process. And then the most brutal part of this is getting those hoops from the, the, the uh, you know, they're up out of that because you are literally, my toes are on the outside and I'm reaching down and you gotta lift this up. What are they like, 60 pounds with the curd in them? Yeah, so the stainless steel hoop alone weighs 20 pounds without curd and then you throw 65 pounds of curd in there and you've got a workout. Yeah, and it's, it's not one. There's like, I don't know, 12, 20 of these guys in there. And, you know, dragging them out, you know, I, they were nice enough. I, you know, I did my one, you know, and then I stood over there kind of whimpering in the corner thinking, oh, please don't make me do it again. And uh, so, you know, at that point, you know, they were putting it in, getting it pressed. And then uh, the next day, the wrap and uh, uh, the uh, uh, big fat around it. So it was pretty cool. Pretty cool. Anything else you want to say about the bandage wrap? No, I think you did a good job uh, explaining it and enjoying it with your almost five o'clock beverage. Close enough. Uh, you know, anytime there's, it's five o'clock somewhere. No. <laughs> All right. So uh, let's, uh, let's go ahead and uh, step into our next cheese. This cheese, like I mentioned, is named after the town in Switzerland where we still have family members to this day. So uh, my father took a trip to Switzerland, tried to learn as much as he could without uh, getting any proprietary cheese making recipes. Um, and that's what inspired this cheese was that, that trip that he took to Switzerland. And he tried so many good local Alpine cheeses to that area of the country. Uh, that we never get to try here in the United States. So this cheese, I would, uh, I would guess for Michael and for those of you that are enjoying this with a, a nice IPA, usually this cheese here seems to go pretty well with any beer pairing. Um, you know, we call it our, our beer pairing cheese. And we really didn't anticipate that we were going to be pairing this with beer until I started doing some beer and cheese pairing sessions <laughs> with Michael, uh, in which we learned that historically people uh, pair cheese and wine. Well, beer and cheese have an awful lot of similarities and uh, characteristics that actually, I would argue, make a better pairing than cheese and wine do. Um, so when you try this cheese, we'd mentioned the earthiness of the banded drap cheddar. This cheese kind of has some of those fruity flavors as well as an earthy undertone. Um, it's, not, it's not as sharp, and I wouldn't even use the word sharp to describe this cheese. Uh, it's mellow, but it's sophisticated. It's got a, a characteristic, and a flavor profile that really is unlike a lot of cheeses out there. Typically, we use this cheese and our San Joaquin Gold for our mac and cheese recipe, uh, putting on a grilled cheese sandwich, 
you can use it like most Swiss or Alpine style cheeses in a fondue, has very good melting properties, um, but feel free to give it a try for yourself and, and let me know what, uh, what you think about the Leonza. This has uh, always been one of my favorite of yours. And, you know, we were talking, you were talking about some of the beer pairings. And uh, when you think about it, I, I've had people tell me, you know, about cows don't eat grapes, they eat grain. And so beer's made out of grain. And so they work, uh, you know, that is a natural part. Um, I've always considered that for most common beer beers or uh, pairings beer does really well it, 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 it does have all those characteristics it's liquid bread so uh, each intensity gives you a, a different different flavor or different uh, pairing capability so on this one uh, I'm using the Sierra Nevada hop bullet on this and uh, this is magnum hops and oh talk about a balance this isn't one of those pine cones uh, that's all citrus. This is really earthy with some sweetness to it. Uh, you really taste the grain on here. And with this cheese, you can really use that kind of grain that goes along with it. Uh, it's, it's not overpowering. It, it balances out really well. Uh, really brings out more of the butter. Uh, and again, there's just a slight earthiness that goes along with it. So, you know, what I'm going to pair with this is uh, a little taste elevated, and it's got some uh, habanero mustard seeds. And this is so cool. These are these are uh, mustard seeds with a little bit of habanero in there, pepper, and some very nice sweetness. Mm. Brings more butter out, brings it a little earthy. There's a spiciness there. But the cheese kind of mellows it out, and you really get to taste the spice, the, the habanero, without the heat. So you don't really get the heat. It's, it's a lot more balanced out. Um, really fun. And uh, I also uh, have, because there's some sweetness here, uh, some rustic bakery. You know, you know these guys pretty well. Uh, and, uh, you know, this is uh, uh, almond and apricot, and, and it's just, you know, works really well. So you can take it from something that being a little spicy to something a little bit more savory. Yeah, all the products that you're, most of the products I should say that you're using today are all uh, Northern California, you know, Bay Area, Chico, Modesto, Central Valley. So it's uh, nice to see that you are bringing the Northern California flavor to Florida today. Absolutely. Rustic Bakery, you know, you can't get a better uh, cracker, wafer, flatbread, all of that. And, uh, you know, of course, Sierra Nevada, you know, they're the, they're, the, they're the best and original of pale ale. Everybody that makes a pale ale, that's a standard that you go by. And I uh, really adore them. I think they really do such a great job. and. Uh, again, another family owned, another family owned. Um, you know, when you when you think about the farms and uh, the all the, the the things that you accompany with this, uh, taste elevated. Uh, Lori Krieger, you know, it's her and her husband, and and you know, it's their family. And so, a lot of times when people go out and they see something up on the shelf, you know, and you're you're buying it, you are supporting a family. You know, a lot of these cheesemakers, like yourself, it's supporting the family, you're supporting the herd, you're supporting the cheesemakers, the people that are handling that. Um, you know, that are the, the, the couple that's making the, the uh, flatbreads. Uh, Lori Krieger, who's making the, the, uh, uh, the, the spreads and the chutneys. So, you know, these are opportunities that you get to enjoy some of the handmade, high quality products and you get to support a family. Yeah, uh, I'm thankfully, uh, given how our relationship has evolved over the years, I've been able to sit on panels with some of those people. And it's a lot of fun because we're all, 
we're all regular people that have passion about making excellent food and products and then sharing our stories. So when you get to see similar products on the same plate, you know, it's really fun. It's, it's a cool experience that, uh, that I'm glad you're helping bring together, Michael. Well, I, I have the privilege and, and uh, the time of, of being able to be friends with you and the others. And uh, I've seen you, uh, I've seen your farm. I, I know the, I know the cheese makers. And, and I think that a lot of comments that I've heard over the years and even sort of some of my friends and, you know, supporting a, a cheese maker. You know, you can go out and there's commodity cheeses in the dairy section and all that. And if you really look at the price difference uh, for the quality that you're getting, it's not that big of a jump. And uh, a lot of times when you run into a product, um, you know, that is that exceptional like yours, it's so wonderful to be able to be able to have that uh, in part of a cheese board or just being able to enjoy it. You know, these uh, are going into recipes uh, part of it. You know, every single piece of cheese that I have is integrated. Either we snack on it or we create a recipe. So over the last couple of weeks, we've been cooking a lot with cheese. <laughs> You're not alone. So, you know, another thing about the Leonza is that those of you that are like sour beers, uh, I, I've stepped into that and uh, it hasn't always been an easy journey for me. Sour beers have always been a little more uh, troublesome for me. Uh, I, I find that uh, pairing them up can be a challenge. Uh, but Boston Beer Company does some sour, some single style sours. And you and I paired this up in Denver with this sour. And it was like the most magnificent pairing uh, of that cheese. And I was really surprised that you would be able to get that. So I think like what you said earlier is, you know, if you have a beer that you like, try it with a cheese. Because at least even if it doesn't work, you still like the beer and you still like the cheese and it doesn't always have to work. Sometimes you just gotta enjoy them by themselves. Well said. Yeah, so the uh, next and final cheese that we're showing and tasting today is our San Joaquin Gold. I spoke about the gold medal mistake that it is, so I won't spend time on that story again. Um, so it is an Italian style, semi-hard cheese, and it's got a really unique flavor when you, when you try this cheese. We don't know how to classify it sometimes because people will ask us, well, is it used like a Parmesan? Or is it like a Fontina? Or is it like an Asiago? And the answer really is none of the above. It's got such a unique flavor to it and a, a really good texture for grating over soups or salads um, or just snacking on. So we're not 100% sure where to put this cheese yet. And I think we're, we're happy about that because it is so unique that it doesn't fall into any category. When we were doing a uh, beer and cheese pairing at another location, we tried this cheese with an imperial stout. And I think we've also tried it with a porter. And one of the panelists, I can't remember who it was, but they hit the nail right on the head when it comes to describing this cheese. And when we tried it with the Imperial Stout or the Porter that, that both have chocolate nodes, they said this is like eating a bowl of popcorn and having a chocolate bar. So it was such a unique uh, description that that person used. And I'll never forget it. But when you try this cheese, it almost seems like you're having movie theater popcorn. Um, and then depending on what you're going to, wash it down with, if that beer happens to have chocolate nodes, it picks up this kind of dessert, really high cream butterfat uh, with chocolate. So this product I love pairing with things because, because of the butterfat and the creaminess of it, 
it usually does really well um, in a variety of parents. I agree. This is, uh, you know, one of the easiest cheeses uh, to eat. Uh, it, it's got such a nice sweetness to it. Um, it's not overbearing. This is the snacking cheese of the snacking cheese. You know, you can just sit down and you don't have to have a big pairing with this. Uh, you, can, you can go across the board um, uh, where you want to go. Uh, it has such a nice sweetness and, and uh, easy goingness about it. I uh, am actually going to pair this up with a sweet and tangy mustard seed. And the reason for that is because I want to bring up the butter in here. And by having that little bit of tanginess, it's going to bring up more butter. And the piece that I tried, Michael, I know that uh, we, we've we got some cheese there on your cheese board. But the piece that I tried definitely had some crunchy um, tyrosine crystals from the aging process that it makes the experience even better. Um, you've got a little bit of that grainy texture. So it's just a... It's a great cheese. I'm glad that we uh, made the mistakes that we did in order to create it by accident. But this cheese has been a great selling product for us over the years. It's a great storytelling piece. Uh, my father named it San Joaquin Gold in order to do the same thing that the Europeans do, which is name a product that was created in a region after the region. So Modesto sits in the San Joaquin Valley along with many other agricultural valley towns that that make products that go all over the world. So San Joaquin Gold named after the valley and then gold was our attempt at humor as we we won a gold medal with it in the first competition that we entered um, not expecting to win anything. So that's why it's called San Joaquin Gold, and that's uh, our way of sharing a little bit about Northern California and the agricultural valley that um, we've been producing products in for over 100 years with uh, you and your family. All right, so this is the Sierra Nevada. This is the 40th anniversary, hoppy anniversary, all right? And uh, uh, again, this is not a hot bomb of citrus and pine. It is real sweet hops. And when you talk about doing something like an imperial stout or doing a porter with the sweetness on here, this Hoppy 40 uh, is, is got that. And so pairing these two up, you really get that savory, wonderful flavor characteristic between the two. But what I like about all of these is that there's a symmetry about them, is that they're not, any one of these is not going to take you down a path of, oh my God, that's such a strong, tangy, super sharp or uh, exceptionally sharp. It's well balanced in its sharpness and it's, and it's butter. Uh, you know, the, the owns a more butter than anything else, but it has a nice balance of that uh, cream flavor. And then of course, the San Joaquin Gold, one of my all time favorite snacking cheeses. And uh, you know, just the, the beauty of that is uh, amazing. Uh, you know, I remember uh, the Rhine, uh, it feels very natural now. I remember there was a time that it was paraffin, right? Yeah, we're, we're using a food grade coating um, on the rind of the San Joaquin Gold. And over the years, we have, we've tried different things um, in order to keep the cheese intact and to keep the right moisture level, even though it is a drier cheese, uh, you don't want any cheese to dry out. So the, the coating that we're using now uh, we've been using for a few years now. We feel like we finally got it down. And that just, I mean, that speaks to 
the fact that we're always learning, we're always trying new things. We want our products to be very consistent wherever they're sold across the country. Um, but we also know that when you're an artisan cheesemaker, no two cheeses are going to taste the same uh, from one day to the next, from one season of the year to the next. So it's a fun challenge that we have of trying to make our products consistent while knowing and maintaining the fact that it's impossible for our cheese to be completely consistent. And, you know, they're not mass produced. They're made in small batches. And I think it's really cool that um, you are able to try three very, very different cheeses that were made from the same cows uh, on the same farm. But you just look at how the flavor profiles are, are so different. And that's our cheesemakers using their talents, the different cultures that we're using, the different aging rooms and processes that are involved throughout the aging process. Um, and that's, that's what makes being a, a small cheese producer challenging and rewarding at the same time. Well, I have endeavored in my career to get your name out, to get more people to taste your cheeses and to, to really get an opportunity because there are a lot of cheeses that are out there that uh, don't even stand a candle to you. You're, these are such exceptional cheeses. Uh, uh, the stories on them are unique. The farming is unique, the farmstead. There's just a lot that goes on here. You know, and uh, uh, one other thing that uh, I was uh, sitting here looking at was uh, that with that sweetness here, you can also uh, use uh, an Effie uh, cracker, uh, their, their uh, shortbread. This is a, uh, a corn cake, and it actually brings out uh, this uh, uh, sweetness and, again, a little earthiness out of there by just adding a little bit of, uh, of, of sweetness to it. And uh, the Effie's is really kind of like a real fun part to be able to have with it. So. I want to thank you so much for taking the time today to be able to do this, come out and play and bring out the cheese and that. And uh, I'm hoping that those that watch this on the recorded uh, version will uh, uh, reach out to Fiscalini.com and, uh, or is it FiscaliniCheese.com? FiscaliniCheese.com. That's right. And order your cheese and do this on your own because this is worth every second of time. Uh, to be able to do that. So, Brian, thank you again so much for coming out and playing. I appreciate it, Michael. Thank you. And to everybody that was able to watch, I encourage you to go to the Artisan Cheese Case and uh, pick up cheese from your, your local farmers, you know, support local family farmers. And I uh, just know that we really appreciate any time that you purchase our products. Thanks, Brian. Thanks, Brian. And again, quite a pleasure to be able to uh, sit down and hang out with you. So for those of you, uh, we'll be back tomorrow. Uh, we have Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday of uh, more cheesemakers coming out. And the most important thing that I want you to take from this is that when you buy from these farmers, when you buy from the, the farmstead cheesemakers, you're, you're supporting the families. So when you go out, buy more cheese from Farmstead Cheesemakers. Good night, everybody. Good night, Brian. Thank you, Michael.